document sits in the archives of the U.S. Senate under document number 1564, public law number 89-110. It is called the Voting Rights Act of 1965. This document will become known as the most important document to the civil rights struggle, one that would give African Americans the right to vote at a protected federal level never before achieved in the U.S. On August 6, 1965, President Johnson signed the Voting Rights Act into law in the presence of Martin Luther King Jr. and others who fought the hard fight in their struggle for the right to vote. It was a day of jubilee and followed on the heels of an event earlier that year, an event that would become known as Bloody Sunday, a day when a group of civil rights marchers demanding their right to vote was met at the foot of the Edmund Pettus Bridge between Selma, Alabama and Montgomery. They would be met by state troopers who would beat some of the marchers, thus earning its name Bloody Sunday. Some 50 years later, another jubilant celebration would take place again, this time with the first African-American president of the United States leading a group of people across that same bridge into that same city. Marching with him and his family were some who actually marched that route on that fateful day in 1965. It was a time of great joy and a time that many would remember that African Americans now have the right to vote in the United States and that without encumbrances. The vote, however, would be challenged by modern day politics and down the road become an additional struggle. This is a history of federal voting rights law in the United States, presented by Broward County Libraries and the African American Research Library and Cultural Center. It is popular belief that African Americans first got the protected right to vote with the Voting Rights Act of 1965. However, even before the Civil War, a few Northern states permitted a small number of black men to register and vote. These states were Maryland, Massachusetts, New York, North Carolina, Pennsylvania, and Vermont. But in Southern restrictive states, voting was a right exercised by only white males. These restrictions led Congress to pass the 15th Amendment, which granted the right to all black men to exercise the right to vote, a law that would be scoffed and resisted by Southern states. The law would go into effect in the year 1869, but before such a time would come, there was the beginning of something called the National Colored Convention. These meetings would begin taking place as early as 1829 and continued well into the time of Reconstruction, beginning with the conventions in places like Ohio and Louisiana and continuing on to where the National Colored Convention would be covered by Harper's Weekly back in February of 1869. But voting rights for Blacks were strongly resisted, even after the passing of the 15th Amendment. Among others, the Ku Klux Klan and Knights of the White Camellia used violence and intimidation to prevent voting by Blacks and the enforcement of the law. And because some states refused to comply with the federal law 
Congress had to pass the Enforcement Act of 1870, with criminal penalty now put into place for interfering with voting rights. And the Force Act of 1871 would further provide federal election oversight of voting sites. In the former Confederate states, blacks were the majority of the voters, and in many districts, black candidates were now being elected to federal, state, and even some local offices. As an example, Hiram Rhodes Revels arrived on Capitol Hill to take his seat as the first black member of the U.S. Congress in 1870, but was met by members determined to block him from being seated, contesting his right to be there and the fairness of his election victory. By the 41st and 42nd Congress, there was a greater number of black members reflecting the growing power of the black vote in southern states, where they were in larger numbers. One of the first black members of the United States Congress was Josiah T. Walls. Born into slavery in 1842 near Winchester, Virginia, during the American Civil War, he was forced to join the Confederate Army. By 1862, he was captured by the Union Army in Yorktown. A year later, he voluntarily joined the United States Colored Troops and rose to the rank of corporal. In 1870, he was nominated as the Republican candidate for Florida's sole at large congressional seat. Walls went on to win the 1870 general election and served in the 42nd Congress. The vote was contested by Democrat Silas Nyrlach. The House Committee on Elections eventually unseated Walls after finding election irregularities. Walls ran for the at-large congressional seat again in 1872 and won. In office, he introduced bills to establish a national education fund and aid pensioners and Seminole War veterans. The end of Reconstruction marked the removal of federal troops from the southern states after something known as the Hayes-Tilden Compromise of 1877. This was an event that would change the fortunes of black voters in southern states. As a result of a very close election in 1877, the Southern Democrat, Samuel Tilden, determined that he would not contest the results and would concede to the Republican president-elect, Rutherford B. Hayes. The compromise would be that federal troops would have to be removed from Southern soil. Troop removal would lead to a climate of violence and intimidation against Southern Blacks to depress their voter turnout, and blatant fraud would be used to even overturn some lawful election results. Between 1870 and 1910, some legislatures used a process called redemption to control districts, reduce Black voting, and minimize the number of Black elected officials. And beginning in the 1890s, some states amended their constitutions and enacted laws to include poll taxes, literacy tests, vouchers of good character, and disqualification for crimes of moral turpitude. Included, as seen here, were receipts necessary to show that one has paid their poll tax, the absence of which would disqualify a voter. To be sure, these requirements disqualified virtually all black voters. By 1910, nearly all black citizens were removed from the voting rolls in the former Confederate states, and restoring these rights would take a 55-year struggle. The U.S. Supreme Court intervenes. In 1915, an Oklahoma law 
is ruled to have violated voting rights for blacks. In 1944, the court determined the white primaries law in Texas is illegal. In 1957, the court created the Civil Rights Commission. In 1960, Alabama gerrymandering law is deemed illegal and struck down by the court. And in 1963, 64, and 65, the establishment of one person, one vote was handed down by the court. Despite the valiant efforts by activists and even several U.S. Supreme Court interventions between 1915 and 1965, only minimal progress was made in the push for voting rights of African Americans. By 1965, concerted efforts to break the grip of state disenfranchisement over black voters would have been underway for 55 years, but achieved very modest success. But African Americans would not be deterred, so by the late 1950s to the mid-1960s, they were even more emboldened and determined than 45 years prior. In 1970, the Voting Rights Act of 1965 was revisited as Section 5 prohibiting changes to the voting process without federal permission had a five-year life only, meaning the law would have to be revisited after just five years. The map shown here indicates the states and districts which came under coverage by Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act. Because they were notorious for having violated the voting rights of Blacks through much of history. Over time, covered districts and states would try to get out from under the mandate of the law. In 1975, for example, Section 5 was again extended, for seven years this time, with added provision to combat gerrymandering and exclusion of minority voters in districts like Bexar County, Texas. President Ford signed this extension into law. In 1982, Congress renewed the special provision of the act for 25 years this time, with a new standard to be put in place in 1985. It allowed jurisdictions, districts, and states to terminate coverage under certain circumstances. As President Reagan signs the law, it was further weakened with several additional conditions. Congress renewed the special provision of the Voting Rights Act again in 2006, this time eliminating provisions for voting examiners. Over that time, much of what was signed into law in 1965 by now had been weakened, watered down, removed, or simply not enforced. So by the time the Civil Rights Act of 1965 had been renewed and revamped for the fourth time, President George W. Bush would be signing a 2006 version that did not even require examiners at covered election sites. The 2006 law, which President George W. Bush signed, would also include several names from the civil rights movement, just in order to make the law palatable enough to pass. Some of these names included Fannie Lou Hammer, Rosa Parks, Coretta Scott King, and Cesa Chavez. But various attempts to dismantle the Voting Rights Act of 1965 persists. But for now, its history endures. A central portion of the Voting Rights Act was deemed unconstitutional and struck down by the U.S. Supreme Court in June of 2013. At the heart of the ruling was the unconstitutionality 
of section 5, its most treasured portion. The 5-4 to four vote freed nine states, mostly in the South, to change their election laws and voting processes without notice or review by the federal government. This was a basic staple of the Voting Rights Act of 1965. The five justices in favor of striking down the provisions of the act were Justices Kennedy, Roberts, Alito, Chief Justice Scalia, and Justice Thomas. Dissenting in favor of holding on to the provisions of Section 5 of the Act were Justices Kagan, Sotomayor, Breyer, and Ginsburg. There is further reading to be found at the African American Research Library and Cultural Center. We invite you to read more about these rights and how they came into existence, and more importantly, how they are seen through the lenses of today's politics and today's desires to change the history of federal voting rights in America. <music>